There we go. That's seven. Okay. So don't mind this thing. It's just in case I say something extraordinarily bright. Right, I have questions from Crystal Station, and that was, um, why, do this, why do some physicians inject the lines? You know how when you're doing forehead, so far what we've been talking about is just doing a standard number of injections right across the top, but the issue is that a lot of people have lines in a particular area, so why is it that... Why is it, if there are lines that go like this, some doctors will specifically go direct, or whatever, Botox people, will go directly into the lines, and others, like me, are more likely to do it just straight across. So remember, my rule for the forehead is that I like to stay medial to the lateral limbal line, and normally, if I had a situation like this where the lines were kind of all over, I would probably just pick my top third of the forehead and go across it like that, four or five injections right across the center. The people who are doing the lines are thinking, I'm not sure what they're thinking because we know that the muscles are going like this, right? So it doesn't really matter where the lines are and assuming that this will diffuse a centimeter then if you do it anywhere within a centimeter of any line, then it's going to diffuse into that area anyway. So I normally don't pay a whole lot of attention to the lines, but I do try and make sure that if I've got my injections across this way, if there are a lot of lines high above that, then I might do a second row of injections as well. So I think what we'll have to do in order to answer that question properly is to look at some pictures and we're going to look at some of you and think, okay, in this exact scenario, where am I going to put it? But generally, the lines will really, the lines will only indicate to me the, the strength of the muscle and the location of the muscle. So there's a lot of people who have muscles that go straight across, or I should say lines that go straight across. The muscles are going like this, right? You know how people have two muscle bellies in their frontalis, right? And there's an aponeurosis in between. So some people have straight lines across. Do you think the aponeurosis is big or small? Small, right? Because if it was big, then there would be a gap between these lines, right? So, okay, let's look at you. So yours is pretty straight across, but you can see the two muscle bellies. So turn and look at him, at them. Do you see how it's a little, it goes down in the middle and up mm -hmm. at the sides? That's because there's two muscle bellies and the, the, the aponeurosis is quite small for him. Some people very clearly have a set of lines on this side and a set of lines on this side. So is the aponeurosis big or small? Big. Big, yeah, okay? So you might approach that a little differently than a person who's straight across. So I use the lines as an indication of whether they're straight across or if they're two muscle bellies. That's my primary purpose for the lines. And then usually I go with my rule of the upper two-thirds of the forehead. If the forehead is really long, I might make two lines of forehead injections. Okay? Does that deal with that question? Because now we're getting into the nitty-gritty of it, right? So what we did this morning was figure out the cookbook method. Standard, you stay within the, the lateral limbal line. You draw your thirds in the forehead, go between the second and third. That's the rule, right? The cookbook. Let's play around with all of those rules at this point because you've got that, right? Okay. Another question. Antibiotics for Botox treatment. So tell me, somebody tell me what you meant by that. Uh, I think it was just, and in the notes you mentioned there's uh, contraindications if you're on tetracycline. I was just wondering why that's... For filler. There's... Um, Oh, now you're getting me because I can't remember what that rule is because it's never come up and I don't even know why. Let me get back to you on that one because I can't even remember why. Um, let me come back to that. Um, absolute contraindications. So, absolute contraindications to Botox. Pregnancy. Pregnancy. 
So the issue is that Botox only travels one centimeter. It doesn't even hit the systemic circulation. So really, it's probably fine in pregnancy. But let, who's going to take 100 pregnant women and 100 non-pregnant women, inject a bunch full of Botox, you know, it's never going to happen. Therefore, we'll never really know. Therefore, <coughs> really, you shouldn't do it during pregnancy because we, we can't really say. Nobody's going to try. So pregnancy is an absolute contraindication. And uh, on my sheet that we'll go through shortly, it says right on my sheet, are you pregnant? Um, and pregnancy, pregnancy is an absolute contraindication, or it, it says it in layman's terms. You can't have Botox if you're pregnant or if you're breastfeeding. And it says that right on my sheet. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, it's now the patient's responsibility. She has now been informed very clearly that you're not to have Botox if you're pregnant. So it's up to her to tell us. I've never run into that, where somebody was pregnant and didn't know it and got Botox done. If they did, I still wouldn't be very worried about it. But I tell them that they can't. Breastfeeding is probably fine. But again, who's going to do that study? Let's see what happens to the kid if the mother's breastfeeding. Not going to happen. Um, other absolute contraindications. Allergy. I have run across maybe two people who are allergic to Botox in the last eight years. And even then, we weren't sure if it was the Botox or something that they ate. You know, it might well have been... Combination. Well, it may have been something that was going to happen anyway, but they happened to get Botox. So, who knows? But get hives or? It doesn't... Not even, or one person got hives. Yeah. I've never had a systemic allergic reaction. Now, if they did, of course, we do keep Benadryl. We keep 50 milligrams PO and IM, uh, uh, PO and IM, available for allergic reactions. We do have a bag valve mask. We have oxygen, and we have epinephrine which is just standard dose, which is 0.3 mils of 1 in 1,000 IM. Never had to use it, but you must have it. And that's it. For Botox, absolute contraindications, that's it. Now, in terms of neuromuscular disorders, because they always say, you know, this can't be used for neuromusculars, it's more of a relative contraindication. Because really, if they have even something like musculosclerosis, Muscular, multiple sclerosis. In the case of multiple sclerosis, they have an irregularity with their nerve function, but is it really a contraindication to Botox? Not really. Um, so I've had people with multiple sclerosis who choose to have Botox, recognizing that they are at higher risk for something to go wrong or for it to get stimulated in the area. Um, but some people have chosen to go ahead with it. So from that point of view, I think it's a, a relative contraindication rather than an absolute. Muscle sclerosis, muscular dystrophy. Those people generally don't want to have Botox in the first place. And a lot of the times, people aren't even diagnosed by the time they have their Botox, right? Like people like um, myasthenia gravis. That one I would stay away from. Remember, myasthenia gravis is the one that really affects its muscle fatigue, and so it affects how you lift your eyelids. And so that one, you would mess them up by giving Botox. So I would stay away from that one for sure. Bleeding disorders. A lot of people go have Botox even if they're on Kumin. Big warning sign. You are more likely to have side effects if you're on Coumadin, but you can do it. Hemophilia, wouldn't recommend it, but you can do it, right? Aspirin, um, anti-inflammatories, Plavix. So my biggest issue with that is that I'm being very specific about where I want the Botox to be after my injection. So for instance, if I inject Procerus and corrugators, and I put it in a very specific location, and then they have bleeding, it's more likely to diffuse somewhere that I don't want it to be, right? Usually down. And down means potentially into levator palpebrae, and that means having a ptosis that will last for a long time. So the risk of side effects is higher because of the bleeding diffusion point. All right? Okay. Anything else on that one? Okay. Let's talk about 
standard doses. Okay. There were some other questions from this oh. morning. Do, do yes. you want to do I them, want them now? Or? Sure. It's, I like questions better than <laughs> coming up with them myself. All right. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Does this say facelift? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Okay, good question. Face, implications for facelift. So, two issues. If they've already had a facelift versus they're thinking about having a facelift done, which one was this? They've already had one? Or they're getting one? Uh, or both? Had one. Had one? one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So people who have had facelifts have their anatomies changed. People who have been burned, people who have any kind of facial surgery, any kind of permanent fillers, anything that's been done to their face has now changed their anatomy. And now they've got surgical, or um, now they've got scar tissue, right? Surgical incisions, scar tissue, the muscles have been moved around. So I think of a face as virginal. You know, if, no, if nobody's ever cut it or put anything permanent in it, then it's essentially virginal. And it's much easier to predict what the results of our injections are going to be if the face has never been touched before. But if there's a bunch of scar tissue in there, for whatever reason, trauma, surgery, burn, that it's going to change the outcome. So, for instance, let's say you decide that you want to do her glabella. And you're counting on it, that's procerus, right, Mrs. Corrugator? You're counting on it diffusing about a centimeter. But what if they've got a big surgical scar right there, not facelift, but say they cut themselves when they were small. Now they've got scar tissue here. So it's not going to react in the same way. Therefore, whenever anybody has any kinds of surgery or trauma or burn, then you tell them in that area, for a good you know, couple of centimeters around that area, we can't predict what the result is going to be. The muscles may be different, the connective tissue may be different, the skin is certainly different, and the diffusion could be different. Therefore, I will do them, but with a lot of explanation about, you know, we can't be 100% certain what the outcome is going to be in this particular scenario, given your background. So, they've had a facelift. I, oh, all facelifts are different, right? Because you don't know necessarily what exactly has been done in the facelift. So I think as a rule of thumb, if somebody's had a facelift, then I look to see if their muscles look like they're behaving normally or not. So if there's anything weird about how their muscles are moving when I look at them, you know, if it's just a pure facelift, then theoretically the skin is just moved back and the muscles should be where they start, right? So I know that I've run into a bunch of people that have a facelift and the muscles seem to be intact and still doing exactly the same thing. But there are some where it appears to me that the muscles are not functioning the same normal way. In which case, I either tell them, I'm going to make my best effort at this, given that it's not, you know, virginal. Don't want to use those words. There's a better word than virginal, normal. They don't want to be told that they're not normal, right? But it's altered. <laughs> and so I have to get some sense of what I can do that will enhance the way your face is now. It, but it's not going to behave the same way as a face that's never had surgery. So they've got a tr choice. They can either go back to their plastic surgeon who does know what was done, and that might be a good choice, or they can do it with me, but I'm not 100% sure if they'll get the same result as a person who's not had surgery. It's a roundabout way of answering the question. I'm really cautious about people who've had anything done to their face in the past. Sounds wise. And if they're one of those people who's had a lot done in the past, I tell them that they really belong at a plastic surgeon's office. So if I get that sense that they can't be pleased, they go somewhere else. But there are lots of people who are, you know, reasonable and nice, and they had a, they had a facelift six years ago, but it's sort of sagging now, and they want some help, and they're fine. Um... Then there's the people who come to us because their face is sagging and it's beyond the scope of what I can fix with Botox and fillers. And there's quite a few of them. So they're 60 years old, their face, face is flat, the skin is loose, and they say, 
I don't want surgery. Do something. <laughs> and you can do a lot. For instance, this lady that I did, she, she could have used a facelift. But instead, I put like 10 fillers in her. And it worked. You know? It's not going to last forever. It will last a long time. It's called a soft lift when you combine Botox and filler. So rather than have a facelift where they cut and pull the whole thing up, what I did was just a little weeny bit of Botox, not very much. And then I put a lot of filler primarily in her cheeks, which really lifted her up. And she looks fantastic and she still looks good. It's been like three years and I haven't touched her since. So that was good. Um, so their options are spend $25,000 on a facelift or spend $6,000 and I fill her up. And a lot of people would choose the filler option. So don't be afraid to suggest a whole lot of fillers because as medical people, we do, we're, not, we're afraid of asking people for money, right? So it's, it's tough for us to say, well, you know, like you could do just this little bit and this will be like $300 and stuff. What I normally do is something like her, this lady with uh, the whole cheek issue, I would say, she'd say, well, I feel, I feel tired. I feel like I look tired. So first thing I do is compliment her in some way. I always find something good to say. It's her, something about her eyes or her face, her skin or something. So I always say at least one or two very nice things. And then I try it because after all, they're not necessarily going to be able to fix what I can see. So if I get in there and say, oh my God, I've got to do this and this and this and this, and she feels like crap. And I feel lousy too because I made her feel bad. <laughs> my goal here is to make people feel better. So I usually get in there and say something nice. And then I say, well, you know what? You've got great eyes. So I think what we want to do is make those look even brighter. And probably the best way to do that is to lift up your cheeks a little. And she's like, oh, okay. So at that point I say, um, if you were to put some filler in your cheeks, then you'd find that this would lift and you'd find that um, it would improve a few things. It'll improve this and here. So you pull up this and it's gonna make a lot of difference. Okay, so now she's feeling enthusiastic. Well, how much does that cost? It's $600, each filler is 600, and really what you need, I'm talking to her, is one on each side because if you did less than that, you would notice nothing, and then you'd be frustrated, so there's no point. So then she goes, and sometimes I stop there, right? And because she, she's happy, I can make her feel a little bit better, do the fillers, cool. But if she says, well, what else? Like, is there more stuff that you can do? Then, I, then at that point, I usually say, well, we have two options. You can either do a little bit at a time, but if you wanted to do a a few things at once that I would suggest what you could potentially do is just put in Botox and filler to sort of almost act like a facelift but that costs like six thousand dollars and then I wait to see if she passes it <laughs> well I either get the or I get oh yeah. right and then you can tell from the body language if she comes forward a little like if, I, if I'm like this, then I back off. If she does this, and if she does this, I keep talking. So she said, oh, well, tell me about that. And so then I get into, well, you know, in order to like restructure your cheeks, and then I just need to put off enough filler to give you some volume. And at that point, I usually haul out this picture and say, here's what I did for this lady. It's not gonna be the same for you, but it's, this is the idea. This is the sort of thing that I'm thinking about. And then often, and you'd be shocked how often this happens, they say, can you do that today? Hmm. And they pay on a credit card. Ooh. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> so you have to be prepared for that. Don't assume that they don't want to put the money into it. Think in the back of your mind that they've made a decision to come see you in the first place. So they're usually pre-sold on Botox. Most of them who come to get a treatment for Botox or filler are ready to buy. Once they've gotten through the door, I find 80% of them buy that day. And some of them just say, okay, just do whatever you need to do. You know, the, the money isn't really my, my point here, I just need to get it done.
So there was this one lady, we often see people who are at a change of life of some variety, like they've lost their job, they've gotten divorced, they're out on the dating scene, they go in for a new job, they turn 40, turn 50, turn 60, 70, um, usually stops around 70. But there's often a change. So this one lady that I had, she said, um, she had been, it's not funny, but to serve us, she had been nursing her husband who was very ill for like three years and he had cancer and she was at home looking after him and she said, you know what, and I hear this a lot, it's time for me. I've been dedicating myself to other people, to, to my husband, my children, and it's, it's time for me now. And so I, I've decided to take this step. I said, okay, so I talk her through all the stuff and I say, so, you know, if you do fillers today, you might have some bruising and stuff. And she goes, oh, well, I really wanted to do it today, but the funeral is Saturday, so maybe not. But, but the insurance check had already arrived. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, you know, like, in fairness to her, nice lady, great client, and, you know, she just, she had it, you know? She, she put herself on hold for so long, mm -hmm. and she was prepared for him to die, and, you know, the whole palliative thing, but it just sort of sounded funny. <laughs> All right, DAO. The question is, so remember the rule for DAO is corner of the nose, corner of the mouth, back to here, and back about a half centimeter or so, um, because the, what's it called, this guy, master, is back here. And there's a depressor labii in here. So there's a scary muscle in here that causes droop if you hit him. So if you go forward by mistake, you'll hit this guy and get a droop. So that's why this rule is in existence. And the question is, is it IM or subcutaneous? And I guess the answer to that is that it's connecting, like you said, it's connecting into skin, right? These muscles are all connecting into skin. So, sub Q is where the muscle is. So it's both, right? If there's a lot of adipose tissue here, don't go very deep. If the, sorry, if there's a lot of adipose tissue here, then you're going to have to go deeper, right? Because the muscle is deeper. And if it's a very thin face, go more superficially, because it is connecting into the dermis of the skin. Does that make sense? Okay. What needle size do you use down there? Size of needles for DAO. I don't think it really matters, but if you've got a lot of adipose, then you're going to have to go deeper, and therefore I would go with the 29. Mm -hmm. If you've if you got a 31, which are the shorter needles, then you may not be able to go deep enough to get to where the muscle is. Okay? Query eyebrow lift versus crow's feet. Yes. Okay. So, here's my, here's my issue. So, the vicularis oculi does this, right? But the muscle is here. It's a purse string muscle, right? So when you contract your purse string muscle, it causes these stellate lines, right? Frontalis is here. So, what I was trying to get across in the video, or what I mentioned briefly, I guess, was this line here, remember what that's called? It's a suture line. Fronto... Zygomaticus? Yeah. Frontotemporal. It's called both. So, somewhere at the orbital rim, there's a notch right here that you may be able to feel on yourself. Generally, it's right close to the edge of the eye, so if you go down here and up a little, on the orbital rim, you'll feel a little notch, okay? So where that notch is, above it is generally frontal muscle, frontalis, and below it is generally orbicularis oculi. So let's think about that for a second. If you inject right here, below the line, based on what I just said, which muscle are you getting? Orbicular. Orbicularis oculi, right? Yeah. So if you inject that, and this gets weak, 
which direction will the eyebrow go, up or down? Oh. Up. Up, right. Because this normally pulls down, so if you relax it, it allows frontalis to pull up, right? Okay. Now think about what if you go on the other side of the line, which is easy to do. You go a little too high. Now what happens? Which muscle are you going to hit? Frontalis. Frontalis normally lifts up, therefore if you Botox it, it relaxes. So what happens to the eyebrow? Droops. Droops. So an eyebrow lift is just the upper fibers of crow's. So it's the same thing as a crow's injection. Got it? So this is the most common mistakes that people make, is that if you don't feel for that notch, then you tend to come a little too far um, superior. So it's easy to make this mistake. You're injecting crow's feet, and in many cases, here's your eye, here's your notch, you think, okay, I'll do one here, and one here, and one here, right? But then you check for the notch, and that dot is actually above the notch, which will create a brow droop. And that's the single most common cause of brow droop that I come across. That's the single biggest novice error, except that nobody of my people do it anymore because I rant about this for so long. Okay, have you got a good sense of where your notch is? Did you find everyone's notch before you do it? I can feel mine. Yeah, you find a good one. Yeah, I find everyone's notch. I always put my finger on the notch before I... Right there. Yeah. Yeah, yours is low. Yours is really low. Yeah, yours is higher. It's mm -hmm. right there. But it's still, like, you know, like, even though it's there, it's still, you know, lower than you, like, it would be easy to make that mistake, wouldn't it? Right there, I think it is pretty low, it's just yeah. about it, right there. It was high, yeah. I was on too. So it always surprises me how low it is. Oh, yours is really low. Hmm. Interesting. Very prominent and very low. Squeeze yeah. shot. Yeah. Raise your eyebrows? Huh. Yeah. So she would really fool you because her notch is so low. So when I'm doing my eyebrow lift, mm -hmm. I don't make marks because I've done it for a long time, right? My advice to you is make your dot and then measure twice, cut once. Uh, make your dot and then relax and then go back and make sure that that dot is below that notch. I do suggest that when you go home, you make dots for everyone and you take several sets of pictures, and tomorrow we're going to go over how to take pictures effectively, because it's a lot harder than you might think. But, make your dots, and take a picture of the patient with dots, um, without dots. So I usually take, if I were you, I would take pictures without dots, and then I would take pictures with the dots. Then I would do the injections, and bring them back in two weeks, and take a picture at the two-week mark. And as a result, you're going to have a record of how many units you put, you'll know exactly what locations you went into, and you'll get an exact result that you can compare side by side. And this is why I have you take the same pictures in the same way every single time, which is a lot harder than you think. I'm still teaching people how to take pictures of all my staff to make it consistent, because unless it's taken from the same angle, with the same expression, it's not much good to you for comparison purposes. Now, you'll come to a time where you don't have to make the dots anymore, but there are plenty of times, particularly on forehead, that I still make dots. Just because it's hard, you're doing the injections and it's hard to keep track of whether you're, they're all straight across or whatever, so I just like to keep track. Anything else on that right now? So there's going to be a lot more Botox time 
Um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit of an introduction on how to do fillers. So let's talk about fillers. Um, the thing to know about fillers is that, like I said, there's a thin, a medium, and a thick product. And then there's superficial, medium, and deep injections. So do you think on the thin product, are you going to be injecting that deep? No. no. There's no value. It's like putting a pea under a mattress. Princess in the pea. If you put a little pea under a mattress, it's not even going to create any kind of a lump at all. It's total waste. But if you put a pea under a, a tight a sheet on top of the bed, you will see a little bit of a lump, right? So the point is that if the defect is small, then you want a pea to fill it. And if the defect is bigger, then you want an orange to fill it. And if it's really deep, then you need a basketball. If you put a basketball under a sheet, it's going to create, it's going to go like this, right? So the basketball goes deep, and the pea goes superficial, or the marble would be a better size. Marble, orange, basketball. Which means... This is epidermis, which is so thin that if you stuck a needle in, you could still see the needle underneath the skin and you still would be into dermis, not epidermis. That's how thin epidermis is. It's teeny tiny. It's 0.1 of a millimeter tops. So you can't inject epidermis. The next layer is dermis. And then there's sub-Q. And then there's uh, muscle. And then there's bone. Now think about it. These things are called intradermal fillers. Good reason for that, because they all go into the dermis. No matter how superficially you try, you'll never get into epidermis. They're all in dermis. So it's a question of whether you're going into superficial dermis, middle dermis, or deep dermis, and which product you're going to put in each layer. So out of those three layers, superficial, medium, and deep, where is the basketball going? Deep. Yeah. And where is the uh, orange going? Medium. 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 And where is the pea going? Superficial. Right? So this is a, is a thin product like Ultra. Into the superficial the dermis will be Ultra. The Metasys equivalent of Ultra is Restylane Fine Lines, but I always use Ultra. Into the Dermis is going to be, it could be Ultra, or it could be Ultra Plus. Into the Deep Dermis is what? Curling or Ultra Plus. So, just to be clear, these are my preferences. There are other companies that make, like TSAL, for instance, that make really great filler. It's just that these are the ones that we've gotten used to, and I tend to use mostly these two and this one. And purling is for when I really have something big. And I'll show you the difference between a person who would use purling versus Ultra Plus. Because now it's a point of choosing not only what am I going to do, Am I going to fill the line or not fill the line? Am I going to fill the nasolabial fold or the cheek? So you've got to then make that differentiation. And once you decide, okay, I'm going to do the nasolabial fold. Now, do I want ultra, ultra plus, or purling? Usually the answer is ultra plus for nasolabial fold. But occasionally it's ultra and occasionally it's purling. So there's no standard answer to these questions. Okay, so fillers are intradermal, right, by definition? Intradermal temporary fillers with hyaluronic acid in them. So how do you think we do cheeks? It's not intradermal. You go all the way down to here. Sorry? Mm -hmm. So with cheeks, you go all the way down to the bone and dump a big bunch down there. Again, the P is going to be of no value whatsoever. A big, thick filler. Big thick filler, so it's all it's often ultra plus and often purling. The difference between ultra plus and purling is ultra plus tends to be more of a 
smooth, even thing. And purling tends to be a little more rock hard. It's more dense, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. So, if I was going to do Christina's cheeks, which I don't know if need to, but if I did, I would use Ultra Plus because I just want a nice, smooth little lift, right? And because you're a guy, any guy that I do, I generally have to push, make, it's, it's harder. I need to lift more. So if I want to lift anybody's cheek that's male, it's almost always curling because they've got thicker skin, it's further down, and they're structurally more sound, so they need something firm, right? So a lot of women I go with Ultra Plus. So this afternoon, it's gonna be very fun. You're going to, in to um, inject cheeks. And the way to do that is very simple. You pick a spot that is the lowest, flattest area, and you stick a needle in it, you go all the way straight down to the bone, barely touch the bone, pull back a millimeter, stay there, and inject. Down here. And what that looks like from the bone point of view, let's say this is the bone, and there's muscle, here's sub-Q, here's dermis and epidermis, right? So your needle is coming at it like this. It's gonna go all the way down to here, come back one millimeter and dump it right there. So what's gonna happen is, what will happen to that muscle? It's, I should have, there's, there's normally a little space here between the bone and the muscle, right? Because the muscle's in, it's in a fibrous sheath usually, right? So if you inject this down here, what's gonna happen to the muscle? Think breast lift. <laughs> it's pulled up. Yeah, so the muscle is going to come like this because it's got something underneath it. So really, it's simulating bone. Mm -hmm. So now it becomes this bone looks like it's like this. And so what happens on the surface?